Welcome to lecture two of our Mathematics One course. This week we start chapter two. I'm going to be talking about rates of change and tangents to curves, briefly, limits of a function and limit laws, and the precise definition of a limit. Let's start by very quickly talking about rates of change and tangent lines to curves. The average rate of change of, of a function y is equal to f of x with respect to x between x1 and x2. Look at the graph at the top. It's how much does y change divided by how much does x change. We use this triangle, which is a capital letter delta for how much it changes. So capital delta y is, means how much does y change. Now, from the graph, we can see that y changes between f of x1 and f of x2. So the change is f of x2 minus f of x1. How does x change? x changes from x1 to x2. So delta x2 is x2 minus x1. If we say that delta x2 is h, we could also write this as f of x1 plus h minus f of x1 divided by h. We'll come back to this later. A line joining two points on a curve is called a secant line. Now I want to talk about slopes of lines. I imagine you've seen this sign when you're driving. This means that the road is going upwards. The 3% means that if our car goes forward 100 meters, the road will rise by 3 meters. In mathematics, we write this as the slope of this line is equal to 3 divided by 100. More generally, if we have a green line like this, and if we can measure, if we can draw a triangle of base A and height B, then we say that the slope of this green line is B divided by A. This green line has slope 3 divided by 3, or slope 1. And the next green line has slope 4 divided by 2. The slope of this green line is 2. Now I have a line which is sloping downwards. Slope here is minus 2 because we're going down, we use a minus sign, divided by 4, or minus a half. So that's slopes of lines. Just draw a triangle, measure the height of the triangle, measure the base of the triangle, and do height divided by base. But how can we describe the slope of a curve, let's say y is equal to f of x, at a particular point, let's say the point x0? Look at this function. What is the slope when x is x0? In other words, what is the slope of the blue curve at the green point? What we can do is we can draw a straight line which just touches our curve at this green point. We draw in our green line so that the slope of the green line has the same slope as the blue curve at this point. And then once we've got a green line, we can draw our triangle and we can calculate the slope of the green line. And then the definition that we're going to use is that the slope of the blue curve is equal to the slope of the green line. We're going to talk more about the slopes of curves when we in lecture four.
I want I don't want to say anything else about section 2.1 I want to move straight on to section 2.2 the limit of a function and limit laws consider the function f of x is x squared minus 1 divided by x minus 1 this function is defined everywhere except at x equal to 1 because we can't divide by 0 so the domain is the open interval from minus infinity to 1, union the open interval from 1 to infinity. And the graph of this function looks like this. Because the function is not defined when x is equal to 1, I'm drawing this open circle on the line at the point where x is equal to 1. But my question is, how does the function f behave when x is close to 1? Well, let's pick two values of x which are close to 1. Let's say we pick x is 0 0.9 and we pick x is 1.1. We can put these in, into the formula at the top. You don't need to raise your hand. If you have a question, you can type it into chat. We can put 0 0.9 or 1.1 into the formula at the top. We can calculate 0 0.9 squared minus 1 divided by 0 0.9 minus 1. And I'll leave it for you to check. The answer is 1.9. Or if we put 1.1 into there, then we get f of x is 2.1. Let's look even closer to x. Let's suppose we look at 0 0.99 and 1.01. .01. Again, we can put these numbers into the formula at the top and we can calculate f of x. If x is 0 0.99, f of x is 1.99. If x is 1.01, .01, then f of x is 2.01. It looks like if x is close to 1, then f of x is close to 2. Let's look even closer and see if that's still true. If we use x is 0 0.999, we get f of x is 1.999. If we use x is 1.001, .001, then we get f of x is 2.001. So it does look like if x is close to 1, x is not equal to 1, remember, because the function is not defined at 1. But if x is close to 1, then f of x is close to 2. We have a notation to write this in maths. We write this as lim for limit. And then underneath lim, we write x arrow 1 because we're looking at when x gets close to 1, of the function f of x, and then we give the value equal to 2. And we read this in English as the limit, as x tends to 1, of f of x is equal to 2. That means that if x is close to 1, but x is not actually equal to 1, but close to it but not equal to it, then f of x is close to 2. For example, the function we looked at before, f of x is equal to x squared minus 1 divided by x minus 1. Know that the limit as x tends to 1 of f of x is equal to 2, but this function is not defined when x is equal to 1. A different function g of x is equal to x squared minus 1 divided by x minus 1 if x is not equal to 1 or g of x is equal to 1 if x is equal to 1. Here's a graph of this function. Because g is equal to 1 when x is equal to 1 
I drew, I, I, I've drawn a filled in circle here and an open circle or a hole up here. Note that this function has the same limit as x tends to 1. The limit as x tends to 1 of g of x is equal to 2. But g is defined at 1, but g at 1 is not equal to 2. That's because limit means x is close to 1, but x is not equal to 1. A third function, h is equal to x plus 1. Here's the graph. Note that the limit as x tends to 1 of h of x is equal to 2. And in th for this function, that's the same as the value of h of 1. Let's talk about limits of some simple functions. First of all, the identity function, the function f of x is equal to x. I've drawn the graph at the top. What is the value of this function if x is close to x0? Well, because f of x is just equal to x, if x is equal to x0, then f of x is also close to x0. So we have that the limit as x tends to x0 of x is equal to x0. How about a constant function? It could be any constant function, but I've chosen the number 13 for this example. Let's suppose we have the constant function f of x is equal to 13. And again, let's suppose that x is close to x0. So here or here, something close to x0, but not actually equal to x0. What is the value of the function if x is close to x0? The function is always equal to 13. It doesn't matter if we're close to x0 or if we're far away from x0. The function is always equal to 13. So the limit as x tends to x0 of a number, in this case 13, is equal to that number, in this case 13. Sometimes limits do not exist. I'm going to show you two functions which do not have limits at a particular point. First, u. This is a function which is defined to be equal to 0 if x is strictly negative, and it's equal to 1 if x is greater than or equal to 0. And my second function, v of x, is also equal to 0 if x is less than or equal to 0, but this time is equal to sine 1 over x if x is strictly greater than 0. Let's talk about u first of all. Here's the graph of u of x. The limit as x tends to 0 of u of x does not exist. <coughs> Why? Let's think about x close to 0 x could be on the right of 0 or it could be on the left of 0. First of all, let's suppose we are just to the left of 0. x is close to 0 and x is strictly less than 0. Let's imagine that we're somewhere here. Then u of x must be equal to 0. Or let's suppose x is close to 0 but x is strictly greater than 0. That's the other way that x could be close to 0, but actually not equal to 0. So let's suppose, if I draw on the graph, we're about here. Then we would have that u of x is equal to 1. But 0 is not close to 1. If we zoomed in on either 0 or, or on one then the other one would disappear off the screen. That means that the limit as x tends to zero cannot exist. What about the second function? 
this function does, does not have a limit as x tends to zero because this function oscillates up and down too quickly if x is strictly greater than zero and x is tending to zero. In other words, if we think of our x moving towards zero from the right, getting closer and closer and closer, then v of x is going up and down, up and down, up and down, faster and faster and faster. It doesn't stay close to a particular number. There is no number that it's always close to. My next idea is the limit laws. First of all, let's suppose that capital M, small capital, capital L, capital M, small c and small k are numbers. Let's suppose that f and g are functions. Let's suppose that the limit of f of x is x tends to z exists and it's equal to capital L. And suppose that the limit is x tends to z of g of x exists and is equal to m. There we have some rules for these limits. The first rule is called the sum rule. That says that the limit as x tends to c of f of x plus g of x is equal to l plus m. So in other words, any time we have a limit of a function plus a function, as long as the limits all exist, it's just equal to the limit of the first function plus the limit of the second function. Rule number two is called a difference rule. And it's the same idea, but instead of a plus sign, we could put a minus sign in. The limit as x tends to c of f of x minus g of x is equal to l minus m, the limit of f minus the limit of g. Rule number three is called the constant multiple rule. We have the limit of a number, k, multiplied by a function. What we can do is we can take the number outside of the limit. The limit of kf is equal to k multiplied by the limit of f. Rule number four is called the product rule. Let's suppose we have our two functions multiplied together. The limit of f multiplied by g is just the limit of f multiplied by the limit of g. And we can do division as well, f divided by g. Although then we need to be a little bit careful because we can't divide by zero. We need to put in this extra condition. We need to make sure that the number m is not zero. Then, as we would expect, the limit of f divided by g is the same as the limit of f divided by the limit of g, l divided by m. Rule number six, there's seven of these rules. Rule number six is called the power rule. If n is a natural number, that's the numbers one, two, three, four, five, etc then we could calculate the limit of f to the power n. And that's the same as the limit of f all to the power of n. If it's unclear on the left side, I'm imagining that there are brackets just here. But, but because of this rule, it doesn't matter where we put the brackets. And then the seventh and final law is called the root rule. Again, n is a natural number, and this is another one where we need to be a little bit careful. 
we need the nth root of L to exist. For example, we know that the square root of minus two doesn't exist. So as long as we don't have anything like that, then the limit as x tends to c of the nth root of f of x is equal to the nth root of capital L, or capital L to the power of 1 over n. Now that we have these seven limit laws, we can use them to calculate limits like this. Find the limit as x tends to 2 of x cubed plus 4x squared minus 3. And this time I'm going to be careful and I'm going to tell you exactly which rules I'm using at each step. First I want to use the sum and the difference rules. The sum rule said anytime we see a plus we can split the limit into two at this point and anytime we see a minus sign we can split the limit into two. So what we get is the limit is x tends to 2 of x cubed plus the limit is x tends to 2 of 4x squared minus the limit is x tends to 2 of 3. <coughs> Next, I want to use the power rule and the constant multiple rule. The power rule says any time we have something to the power of a number, we can take that outside of the limit. The limit of x cubed is the same as the limit of x, all cubed. In the second term, again I'm using the power rule, but I'm also using the constant multiple rule. The constant multiple rule says any time we have a number, in this case 4, we can just take it outside. So that's 4, limit is x tends to 2 of x, all squared. And then the third term I haven't changed. <coughs> and then at this point, we're ready to calculate the answer. This is the identity function. We saw earlier the limit as x tends to 2 of x is just 2. So the first term is 2 cubed. And again, I have the identity function. So that's just 2. And then at the end, I have a constant function. The limit of 3 is just 3. Let's do another one. Find the limit as x tends to 6 of 8 multiplied by x minus 5 multiplied by x minus 7. Using the constant multiple rule, we can take the 8 outside of the limit and then we have the limit of a function multiplied by a function. Using the product rule, we can split that into two limits. The limit of the first function multiplied by the limit of the second function. And then just replace the x by the number and calculate the answer. Replace this x by 6, so we get 6 minus 5. Replace this x by 6, we get 6 minus 7. Find the limit as x tends to 5 of x to the power of 4 plus x squared minus 1 divided by x squared plus 5. That's a function divided by a function. And the limit of the function on the bottom is not 0. So we can use the quotient rule. It's the limit of a function divided by the limit of the other function. We can use the sum and difference rules to split them up into three different limits on the top, two different limits on the bottom, and then the power rule to calculate each of these limits. I'm going to go ahead. You, you can come back and check this later. Find the limit as x tends to minus 5 of...
x squared plus 3x minus 11 divided by x plus 6. This is the same type of question as the previous one. We have function divided by a function. The limit of the thing on the bottom is not 0. The limit as x tends to minus 5 of x plus 6 is not 0, so we can use the quotient rule. Then we use the other rules, so sum and difference rules and then power rules, to split this up and calculate this. Again, I'm being deliberately quick here. You can check this later. Okay, so that's one way to do it. But is there an easier way? And the answer is yes. If we have a polynomial, then the limit as x tends to see of this polynomial is always equal to the polynomial evaluated at c. And then if we have, if we can, if we combine that with the quotient rule, we can do the same thing for rational functions. If q of x, if p of x and q of x are polynomial functions, and if q of c is not equal to zero, because we can't divide by zero, then the limit as x tends to c of p of x divided by q of x is equal to p of c over q of c. Which one are you asking about? Oh, the one we started with. We, ha we haven't got to that yet. So, using the previous theorem, we can write down that the limit as x tends to minus 1, x to the power of 3 plus 4x squared minus 3 divided by x squared plus 5. As long as the limit of the function on the bottom is not 0, we can just replace every x by minus 1. So, minus 1 cubed plus 4 times minus 1 squared minus 3 divided by minus 1 squared plus 5. And then in the second example, it's the same type of question. The limit as x tends to 2 of this rational function. The limit of the function on the bottom is not 0, so we can just replace every x by 2. 2 cubed plus 4, 2 squared minus 3 divided by 2 squared plus 5. But what do we do if the limit of the thing on the bottom is equal to zero. If we're looking at the limit as x tends to c of p of x over q of x, what can we do if q of c is equal to zero? For example, let's suppose we want to find the limit as x tends to 1 of x squared plus x minus 2 divided by x squared minus x. Now, if we just put in x is equal to 1, we would get 0 on the top and 0 on the bottom. But that's not the answer. We don't want 0 divided by 0. That's not a number. So what can we do here? Yeah, instead we can try to factorize this. If x is not equal to 1, and let me just emphasize, when we're doing limit as x tends to 1, that means that x is close to 1, but x is not equal to 1. 
So anytime we do our calculation, it's going to be okay for us to assume that x is not equal to 1. As long as x is not equal to 1, we can factorize the top and the bottom and then cancel the x minus 1s and we're left with x plus 2 divided by x. And at that point, we can just replace the x's by 1s. 1 plus 2 on the top and 1 on the bottom. Here's another example. Find the limit as x tends to minus 5. x squared plus 3x minus 10 divided by x squared plus 5x. I can't just replace x by minus 5 because then I would get 0 on the bottom. So we need to factorize them. It's okay for us to assume that x is not equal to 5 because we're doing limits. We can factorize our function to x plus 5, x minus 2, divided by x, x plus 5, cancel the x plus 5s, and we're just left with x minus 2 over x. And at that point, we can replace every x by minus 5 to get our answer. Find the limit as x tends to 0 of the square root of x squared plus 100 minus 10 divided by x squared. This is another one of those 0 divided by 0 limits. That's not the answer because that's not a number. There's a trick that we can use for limits like this. If we have an, something which looks like a minus b in a limit, the trick we're going to do is we're going to multiply by a plus b. Why are we going to multiply it by a plus b? Because a minus b multiplied by a plus b is equal to a squared minus b squared. So in this limit, I'm thinking of this as the a, and I'm thinking of this as the b. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of x squared plus 100 plus 10. Okay, so here we are. I'm taking my limit, multiplying the top by this green square root of x squared plus 100 plus 10, and I'm multiplying the bottom also by the square root of x squared plus 100 plus 10. And because a minus b multiplied by a plus b is equal to a squared minus b squared, on the top we have x squared plus 100 minus 100. Or on top, we just have x squared. That will cancel out with the x squared on the bottom. And we're just going to be left with 1 divided by the square root of x squared plus 100 plus 10. Now, it's OK to replace the x by a 0. That's 1 divided by the square root of 0 squared plus 100 plus 10, or 1 divided by 20. The key step here was to notice that we have an a minus b in our limit, and by multiplying top and bottom by a plus b, this would get 
This would simplify. The next idea is the idea of the sandwich field. I suppose we got three functions like this, a green function, a blue function, and a red function. And let's suppose that the blue function is in the middle. In other words, the blue function is sandwiched in between the green function and the red function. In other words, Suppose that f of x is less than or equal to g of x is less than or equal to h of x. The, the function g is sandwiched between f and h. And I don't need, to, need this to always be true. I only need this to be true close to c. So if I go back to my picture and if I draw on it a little bit, I only care what happens close to c. So if something different happens over on the left, maybe we have something like this on the left, it doesn't matter. I only care what happens if we are close to C. And I want to suppose that the limit of the function on the bottom is the same as the limit of the function on the top. The smallest function f has the same limit as the biggest function h. We go back to the picture. At c, the red function and the green function are moving together. They're getting closer and closer. They have the same limit at c. What can we then say about the limit of the blue function at c? If the blue function is squashed between red and green, then the middle function must also have the same limit. We can use that for things like this. We're told that this inequality holds or is true for all x close to zero. And then we're asked to calculate the limit as x tends to zero of x sine x divided by 2 minus 2 cos x. Now, this one we're asked to calculate is quite a complicated formula. But because of the inequality, we don't need to do that. We have an easy function on the right and we have an easy function on the left. What is the limit as x tends to zero of the function on the left of the smaller function? The limit as x tends to zero of one minus x squared over six is just one. What is the limit of the bigger function, the function on the right? The limit as x tends to zero of one is just one. So the limit of the function on the left is one. The limit of the function on the right is one. And the function in the middle is then squashed or sandwiched between one and one. So the sandwich theorem says our function in the middle must also have the same limit. We must have that the limit is x tends to zero of x sine x divided by two minus two cos x is equal to one. I'm going to need the sandwich theorem again in a moment. But first, remember at the end of the last lecture, we found these two inequalities. Sine theta is always between minus absolute value of theta and absolute value of theta. And one minus cos theta is also between minus the absolute value of theta and the absolute value of theta. But the limit as theta tends to zero of minus absolute value of theta is just zero. And the limit as theta tends to zero of the absolute value of theta is also zero. So I have 
limit is zero on the left and limit is zero on the right. What does that tell us about the limit of the thing in the middle? By the sandwich rule, the sandwich theorem, the limit is theta tends to zero of sine theta, which is squashed between zero and zero, must also be zero. And for the same reason, the limit is theta tends to zero, one minus cos theta is equal to zero. Rearrange the right one a little bit. We can see that the limit is theta tends to zero of cos theta must be equal to one. These are important results, so let's write them as a theorem. We're going to need these later in the course, so remember these. I'll come back to these in a few weeks' time. A similar result to the sandwich theorem is this. Let's suppose we only have two functions, f and, f and g, and let's suppose f is smaller than g, f of x is less than or equal to g of x, for all x close to c. So again, I don't care what happens all of a long way away. I only care that if we're close to c, then f is smaller than g. So it doesn't matter what happens all the way on the left or all of the way on the right, it doesn't matter. We only care what happens if we're close to C. Let's suppose that the limit as X tends to C of F of X exists and the limit as X tends to C of G of X exists. Then the limit of the smaller function must be smaller than the limit of the bigger function. Now, let me just give you a warning. It's not true that if f is strictly greater than g, then the limit of f is strictly less than the limit of g. The actual result is that if f is strictly less than g, that only implies that the limit of f is less than or equal to the limit of g. Why? Because they, can get, they could get close to each other. Let's suppose we have two functions which look like this. Let's suppose they just touch at C. Then as long as we are close to C but not actually at C, F is strictly less than G, but they have the same limit. And that comes, that brings me to a good point to take a break. I'm going to take, how many minutes? 14 minutes break, and then I'm going to continue talking at three o'clock.
And now let's continue. Section 2.3 is the precise definition of a limit. Now, some people say that this is the most difficult topic in Calculus 1. So don't worry if you don't understand everything in the next part of the lecture um, straight away, but just keep reading this in the textbook, keep re-watching the lecture and you, you will get it. Think about the function y is equal to 2x minus 1, close to x is equal to 4. Consider the function y is equal to 2x minus 1, close to x equal to 4. We think that if x is close to 4, but remember when we're doing limits, we're always x not equal to 4, but just close to 4, then we think that y is close to 7. So we think that the limit as x tends to 4 of 2x minus 1 is equal to 7. But what does this really mean? How can we make close to precise? This is mathematics. We don't just want to say it looks like it's close to. We actually want, we want to know what does it really, really mean? How close to 4 does x need to be to make y close to 7? Actually, how close to 4 does x need to be to make the absolute value of y minus 7 be less than 2? I want y to be here. I want y to be between 5 and 9. I want the distance between y and 7 to be less than 2. So which values of x do I need? If I want that the absolute value of y minus 7 is less than 2, then I'm going to need to have the x is between 3 and 5. How did I know that? Let's start with what I want. I want that the absolute value of y minus 7 is less than 2. So in other words, I want minus 2 less than y minus 7 less than 2. I want y minus 7 to be between minus 2 and 2. Add on 7, I want to have 7 minus 2 is less than y is less than 7 plus 2. So I want y is between 5 and 9. Okay, but what's y? Look at the yellow box at the top. y means 2x minus 1. So what I want is... 2x minus 1 is between 5 and 9. Let's add on 1 to each of these. We're going to do 5 plus 1, 2x minus 1 plus 1, and 9 plus 1. I want to have that 2x is between 6 and 10. Divide everything by 2. 6 divided by 2, 2x divided by 2 and 10 divided by 2. I want to have that x is between 3 and 5. Now look back in the yellow box. Remember we're close to x minus, we're close to x is equal to 4. So what I really want in the middle is x minus 4. So let's subtract 4 from everything. 3 minus 4 is less than x minus 4 is less than 5 minus 4, or 
minus 1 is less than x minus 4 is less than 1. Change this back into an absolute value sign. What I need is absolute value of x minus 4 is strictly less than 1. We can write that like this. The absolute value of x minus 4 less than 1 implies that the absolute value of y minus 7 is less than 2. If the absolute value of x minus 4 is less than 1, then the absolute value of y minus 7 is less than 2. Now, let me repeat myself. Look in the box at the top. For this problem, we're looking at x close to 4. Because we're looking at close to 4, we always want to end up with x minus 4. I always want to have x minus 4 at the end because we're looking at x close to 4. So uh, let's suppose I, I've got to this point. Let's suppose I know x is between 3 and 5. I want to subtract 4 so that I get my x minus 4 in the middle, and then the other numbers will become whatever they become. Now, on this slide, the top, the top calculation is our rough calculation. This is what we would do on, yes, that's right. This is what we would do on scrap paper. And we do this so that we get the thing at the bottom. This is the idea that we're going to use to precisely define what a limit is. Let's suppose we have some function, any function. This is just some, fun some function I drew. And let's suppose we're looking for at x close to c, and we think that the limit is going to be the number l. Let's suppose I want to make y be between l minus 10 and l minus 1 over 10 and l plus 1 over 10. Then we're going to, after we've been told that, then we need to choose the green in strip. We need to, to have x is between c minus delta and c plus delta for some number delta. Or maybe. I wanted to insist that y is in this orange strip. I wanted to insist that y is between L minus 1 over 100 and L plus 100. After I've got that, I need to find the width of my green strip. I need to find where x is. Or if I'm told y must be in this orange strip, then I find this green strip. Or we can go even smaller. Let's suppose we're told y must be in this very small orange strip. Where is x going to be? Then we're going to choose our thin green strip, which makes y be in the orange strip. Now, anytime you see delta or epsilon in this course, think small number. We want, if x is close to c, but x is not equal to c, then f of x is close to l. Or more precisely, we want, if the absolute value of x minus c is between 0 and delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon.
this part, which I'm underlining in red, is a more precise way of saying x is close to c, but x is not equal to c. And the part which I'm underlining in blue is the same as, well, the, the part underlined in blue is a more precise way of saying f of x is close to l. Remember, delta and epsilon are very, very small numbers. So if the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, that means that the x must be close to c. If the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon, then that means that f of x must be close to l. And here's the key point. We want this to always be true. Doesn't matter how small an epsilon we have, we want it to always be true that we can find the delta. Go back to the pictures. Doesn't matter if we have this wide orange strip or a small orange strip, we need to always be able to find delta such that if x is closer, so x is closer to c than delta, then f of x is closer to L than epsilon. So this is the formal definition. This is what a limit really means. We write that the limit as x tends to c of f of x is equal to L, if and only if, I double f means if and only if, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero, such that if the absolute value of x minus c is between zero and delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Or to understand it, for any epsilon, doesn't matter how small an epsilon we're given, we can always find a delta such that if x is close to c, then f of x is close to l. And this concept is what some people say is the hard, hardest idea in the calculus one. So don't worry if you don't get it straight away. Let's go through the important parts of this definition. The first part is for all epsilon. This thing needs to be true for any epsilon. It doesn't matter if epsilon is one over 10 or one over 100 or one over 1,000 or one over a million or one, one divided by a billion. It doesn't matter how small epsilon is, this, this, the rest of this statement must always be true. The second important part here is that there exists a delta greater than zero. There exists some small number such that, and then there's the conclusion of the definition, which is a precise way of saying, if x is close to c, then f of x is close to l. Let's do an example show that the limit as x tends to 1 of 5x minus 3 is equal to 2. Now, here our function is 5x minus 3, c is equal to 1, and our limit capital L is equal to 2. So our answer is going to look like this. The first part of the definition was about epsilon. So the first part of our answer is going to be about epsilon. So first, let epsilon be greater than zero. In other words, let epsilon be any number. It doesn't matter how big or how small. We need, we need, the rest of it needs to be true, even if epsilon is incredibly small. The second part of the definition was about delta. The second part of the definition said, there exists delta greater than zero. So the second part of our answer needs to be about delta. 
No, I've written, I've done a blank here. I've written choose delta equal to something. At the moment, I don't know what to write there. Then, and then we move on to the, the third and final part of the definition, which is the conclusion. If x is close to one, then our function is close to two. If the absolute value of x minus one is between zero and delta, then the absolute value of 5x minus 3 minus 2. And then again, I've got a blank because I don't know what to write there yet. And then less than epsilon. If we can fill in these two blanks, then we've finished the answer and we've proved that the limit as x tends to 1 of 5x minus 3 is equal to 2. So all we need to do is to fill in these two blanks. And for that, we need some scrap paper. I'm going to start with what we want, the conclusion. The absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. For this example, f of x is 5x minus 3 and capital L is 2. So I have absolute value of 5x minus 3 minus 2 is less than epsilon. I'm going to play with this and I'm going to find what values of x will make this true. So first of all, 3 plus 2 is 5. So that's the same as absolute value of 5x minus 5 is less than epsilon. I can take a factor of 5 outside of the absolute value signs, and then I can divide both sides by 5. We want to have that the absolute value of x minus 1 is less than epsilon over 5. But then we know which delta to choose. That tells us that we can choose delta is equal to epsilon over 5. OK, let's get rid of the scrap paper. I can fill in epsilon over 5 just here. And then I need to fill in the second blank. I need to prove that if delta is equal to epsilon over 5, then the absolute value of 5x minus 3 minus 2 is less than epsilon. So basically, I'm going to be doing what I did on the scrap paper, but in reverse. I get that that is equal to the absolute value of 5 multiplied by x minus 1, or equal to 5 multiplied by the absolute value of x minus 1. Remember, absolute value of x minus 1 is smaller than delta, but delta is equal to epsilon over 5. So that's smaller than 5 times epsilon divided by 5, which is just epsilon. And then I finished the proof. Let's just re let's just run through the parts of the definition compared to the parts of the answer. The first part of the definition was for all epsilon greater than zero. The first part of my answer, let epsilon be greater than zero. The second part of the definition is there exists delta greater than zero. How can we prove that there exists delta? By choosing it. So the next part of my answer is choosing a particular delta. For this, for this example, the correct answer was choose delta is equal to epsilon over 5. And then the final part of the definition, and so the final part of our proof, the final part of our answer is the conclusion. If x is close to 1, then 5x minus 3 is close to 2. Or more precisely, if the absolute value of x minus 1 is between 0 and delta, then, or this implies, 
the absolute value of 5x minus 3 minus 2 is less than epsilon. Let's do some more examples. For the limit, limit as x tends to 5 of square root of x minus 1 is equal to 2. Find a delta greater than 0 that works for epsilon is equal to 1. Now, in other words, that means find a delta greater than 0 such that this is true. We want, to, we want the orange thing to be true. We want the absolute value of x min, of the square root of x minus 1 minus 2 to be strictly less than 1. How can we make that be true? By choosing the right delta such that if the green condition is true, then the orange condition is true. So we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to start with what we want. We're going to start with this orange condition and we're going to work backwards until we find our delta. Absolute value of the square root of x minus 1 minus 2 less than 1. That means that the absolute, that means the square root of x minus 1 minus 2 is between minus 1 and 1. Do plus 2 to each term, so that means the square root of x minus 1 is between 1 and 3. But then x minus 1 must be between 1 and 9. So x must be between 2 and 10. So we need to have the x is between 2 and 10. What delta are we going to choose? We need to choose a delta such that the open interval 5 minus delta 5 plus delta is contained inside the open interval from 2 to 10. Now I could have delta is 2.5. If I choose delta is 2.5, then the green interval is contained inside the red interval. Or, if I wanted to, I could choose delta equal to 1. If delta is equal to 1, then again, the green interval is contained inside the red interval. Or I could choose delta equal to 3. That would also be true. Now, now, to answer this question, we don't need to find the best delta or the biggest delta. We only need to find a value of delta which works. So we could choose any one of these numbers. From the picture, we can see that we could choose any delta between 0 and 3. So delta equal to 2.5 would be a correct answer to this question. Delta equal to 1 is a correct answer to this question. Delta equal to 3 is a correct answer to this question. I'm going to choose delta equal to 3. Now note that if delta equal to 3, then the calculation works. If the absolute value of x minus 5 is between 0 and 3, then that means x minus 5 is between minus 3 and 3, or x is between 2 and 8. Now, this is where we put in this extra bit or extra width that we didn't need on one side. If x is between 2 and 8, then it's also true that x is between 2 and 10. But then x minus 1 is between 1 and 9. Square root of x minus 1 is between 1 and 3. 
and square root of x minus 2, x minus 1, minus 2, I'm sorry, is between minus 1 and 1. And we end up with the orange line, absolute value of the square root of x minus 1, minus 2 is less than 1. As I said before, delta equal to 2.5, delta equal to 2, delta equal to 1, etc., are also correct answers to this problem. But delta equal to anything which is bigger than 3, for example, 3.0001, is not a correct answer. The question didn't say choose the biggest possible delta. The question just said choose a delta which works. So there are infinitely many correct answers to this question. Now, let me introduce two symbols. Three point zero zero one is not the correct answer. If I go back to this picture, if we chose delta is some number which is bigger than three, for example, three point zero zero one, then the green interval is not contained inside the red interval. In our calculation, we found that we must be in the red interval. So we need our green interval to be contained inside the red interval. If delta is bigger than 3, then we're going to come out of the left side. Let me introduce two new symbols. This upside down capital A is the symbol for for all. And this backwards capital E is the symbol for there exists. And you can remember which is which. All starts with the letter A and exists starts with the letter E. Theorem. The limit as x tends to c of x is equal to c. This is the limit of the identity function. And I stated this earlier, and we've been using it, but let's actually prove it. To prove it, we need to use the formal definition of the limit, the epsilon and delta definition. The first part of the definition was about epsilon, so the first part of our proof is about epsilon. Let epsilon be greater than zero. The second part of the definition was about delta. So the second part of the proof is going to be about delta. And because I've already done this before, I already know which delta to choose. I've already got my scrap paper out. I've done the calculation backwards. I found what delta that I need. So I can just write it down. Choose delta is equal to epsilon. Then we do the conclusion of the definition. If x is close to c, or more precisely, if the absolute value of x minus c is between 0 and delta, then the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, because of course it is, and delta is equal to epsilon. And that's it. That is the proof that the limit is x tends to c of x is equal to c. Theorem. The limit of a constant function, the limit is x tends to c of a number k is equal to k. Again, I want to prove this. First part of the proof. Let epsilon be greater than zero. Second part of the proof is about delta. And again, because I've done this before, I know a delta that I can choose. 
I'm going to choose delta is 123,456,789. Of course, I'm being silly here. I could choose any delta that I wanted. Then, and this is really not really needed, but then if x is close to c, that implies that k minus k is zero. And zero is always smaller than epsilon. That's why, in fact, I could choose any delta I wanted here, because we always get zero is less than epsilon here. Prove that the limit as x tends to 2 of f of x is equal to 4. If f of x is the function which is equal to x squared, if x is not equal to 2, and equal to 1 if x is equal to 2. Okay, our answer is going to look something like this. First epsilon, then delta, and then the conclusion. And there's gaps here because we don't know what to put in yet. How do we find which delta we want? We use our scrap paper. Now, assuming that x is not equal to 2, and we can always do that. Anytime we have a limit as x tends to 2, that means x is close to 2, but x is not equal to 2. So it's OK to assume x is not equal to 2. Absolute value of f of x minus l less than epsilon is the same as for this example, absolute value of x squared minus 4 is less than epsilon. I'm going to start with the end, and I'm going to work backwards to find my delta. So I'm playing with this. x squared minus 4 must be between minus epsilon and epsilon. Add 4 onto everything. x squared must be between 4 minus epsilon and 4 plus epsilon. So x must be between the square root of 4 minus epsilon and the square root of 4 plus epsilon. Remember, I want to end up with an x minus 2. So do a, do a minus 2 to each term. x minus 2 is between square root of 4 minus epsilon minus 2 and square root of epsilon plus. So square root of 4 plus epsilon minus 2. Uh, running out of space, another bit of scrap paper. The picture looks something like this. This distance in red is... 2 minus the square root of 4 minus epsilon. And this distance in green is square root of 4 plus epsilon minus 2. And we might ask, which of these is smaller? And it doesn't matter. Whichever number, whichever one of these numbers is smaller is the one that we, 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 that we want. We don't actually need to find it. We can just write, choose delta to be the minimum of these two numbers. Whichever num one of these numbers is smaller, that's the delta we're going to take. Now we can finish writing the answer. And... The rest of the answer is basically what I did on the scrap paper, but written backwards. If x is close to 2, if the absolute value of x minus 2 is between 0 and delta, then, and we did this on the scrap paper, x minus 2 must be between these two numbers, Add on 2, square it, subtract 4, and we end up with where we want to get to. 
all of this is just what I did on the scrap paper, but written in the opposite order. Let's do another one. Prove that the limit as x tends to 1 of 1 over x is equal to 1. You'll find this in your textbook on page 81. It's exercise 43. I've written down part of the answer because part of the answer is always going to look the same. Let epsilon be greater than 0. Choose delta is equal to something. Then... 0 is less than the absolute value x minus 1 is less than delta implies something. To go any further, we need our scrap paper calculation. And here it is. We start with what we want to finish with. We want the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Our function is 1 over x. Our limit capital L is 1. So we want to get absolute value of 1 over x minus 1 is less than epsilon. So we, pl we play with that. we end up with, and let me remind you, we want to end up with x minus 1. We end up with x minus 1 is between minus epsilon over 1 plus epsilon and epsilon over 1 minus epsilon. Now, there's two ways to, to proceed. We could either say, we'll choose whichever one of these is smaller. We could, like I did in the previous example, we could just write, choose delta equal to minimum, and then we could write down two numbers. But but this time, I know which one of these is bigger and which one is smaller. I know that the smaller one is epsilon over 1 plus epsilon. Make the bottom of a fraction bigger, the whole fraction gets smaller. Choose delta to be the smaller number. Choose delta is epsilon over 1 plus epsilon. Right, so now I know my delta, I can fill that in. The answer is let epsilon be greater than zero. Choose delta is equal to epsilon divided by one plus epsilon. Then if the absolute value of x minus one is between zero and delta, then, and then we do the calculation. And this is all from the scrap paper, but written in reverse. Let me repeat that. I'll go back two slides. Take all of this, change the order top to bottom, and then write it just here. And then we've finished. That proves that the limit as x tends to 1 of 1 over x is equal to 1. Prove that the limit as x tends to minus 3 of x squared minus 9 divided by x plus 3 is equal to minus 6. The answer is going to look like this, because the answer always looks like this. Let epsilon be greater than 0, choose delta is something. Then, if x minus minus 3 is between 0 and delta, then... So the, the point on when we do scrap paper is we do it backwards. When I'm using my scrap paper, I'm starting at the end and I'm working backwards to get to the beginning. But then when I write my answer properly, the, the correct answer goes forwards. The correct answer starts at the beginning and finishes at the end.
So let's get, it, get the scrap paper up. Let's start at the end of the answer. The end of the answer is going to be absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. And for this example, that's absolute value of x squared minus 9 over x plus 3 minus minus 6 is less than epsilon. And then we're doing, on scrap paper, we're doing our backwards answer. And I'm going to go quickly here. You can come back later, look at the lecture slides or watch the video and just check that you're happy with this calculation. At the end of my backwards answer, which means at the start of the proper answer, I get absolute value of x minus minus 3 is less than epsilon. And that tells me that I can choose delta is equal to epsilon. Okay, fill that in. Let epsilon be greater than zero, choose delta equal to epsilon. Then, and now let's take everything on the scrap paper and write it in the opposite order so that we now it becomes a forwards answer. And that's the end of the proof, that's the end of the answer. This proves that this limit is equal to minus six. Now, before I finish, I want to prove the sum rule for limits. Suppose that the limit is x tends to c of f of x is equal to l, and suppose that the limit is x tends to c of g of x is equal to m. Then the sum rule says the limit of f plus g is equal to l plus m. What's the first line of our proof? What's the first line of all of these examples? What's the first sentence? The first sentence in this type of mathematics is always let epsilon be greater than zero. Now, we know that the limit of f of x is equal to l. So we know there exists some number delta 1 such that if the absolute value of x minus c is between 0 and delta 1, then f of x is close to l. How close? As close as we want. We could choose any number here. I can say I want to have epsilon over 2 here. Remember, the definition says this needs to be true for all numbers epsilon. So we could put anything we wanted here. I could put one here, I could put one divided by a million here, anything I want. I want to put epsilon over two here. And we know that the limit of g is equal to m. So we know that there exists some number delta two such that if x is close to c, then g of x is close to m. How close? As close as I want it to be. Again, I want to write epsilon over 2 here. The next step, nice neat one, whichever one of these numbers is smaller is the one I want. Out of delta 1 and delta 2, I want to take the smaller number. So I'm writing choose delta b, the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2. Now, I go on, look in the yellow box at the top. This inequality is called the triangle inequality. A and B are any numbers. The absolute value of A plus B is always smaller than the absolute value of A plus the absolute value of B. I'm going to be using that here. Now I'm ready to finish the proof. This is slide 59 out of 60. So we're about to finish. If x minus c is smaller than delta, and delta is the smallest number out of delta 1 and delta 2, then using the triangle inequality in the yellow box, absolute value of f plus g minus l plus m 
is less than or equal to absolute value of f minus l plus absolute value of g minus m. And because x is close to c, closer than delta 1 and closer than delta 2, which, because we're taking whichever one is smallest, each of these are smaller than epsilon over 2. And epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 is equal to epsilon. And that's the end of the proof. That proves the sum rule. I hope you understood some of section 2.3 today. As I said before, lots of people say that this is the hardest topic in calculus one. Um, It's I can't give a definite answer. It's unlikely you would be asked to prove a theorem, but it's possible that you would be asked to prove a limit. So any like any of these examples I've done. Let me go back. You might get asked something like this. Prove this limit is equal to a number. I think the discussion board is the best place for questions outside of lesson. So either write your questions down and then you can ask me at the end of the next lecture or ask them on the discussion board and then I'll type the answer there. Oh, just before I finish, next lecture we'll finish chapter two, one-sided limits, continuity, limits involving infinity and asymptotes, asymptotes of graphs. Thank you.